as I'm studying typology and the covenants of God, um, so much is being opened up to me. Um, I've been doing a lot of studying um, of some top-notch theological scholars and uh, just getting information that I never really... I mean, it's actually, it's stuff that I've seen before and I've heard before, but I, I never really paid too much attention before, as you're going to see the reason why. I'm going to be talking to you today about information that um, is not widespread, is not taught in a widespread fashion in the church today. All right? And um, the reason being is because it, it butts up against some of our core doctrines and makes us, ch it challenges us to reevaluate how we define words and meanings. I'm not going to tell you what I mean by that. I'm just going to start preaching and then I'll explain it to you as we get there. We are entering into the um, fourth part of the covenant series, God's Covenants. And we are up to the Noahic Covenant. My original intention was to preach this to you in one week. But then I learned so much that I needed to give you... You know how we go out and witness? We give them the bad news first. You're all sinners. And then we give them the gospel. Well, the Noahic Covenant is the exact same way. There's some bad news that we're going to have to discuss, family, before we could talk about what comes after all right? And this bad news has to do with the fall. It has to do with uh, fallen angels. It has to do with demons and impure breeding by, let's just say, the church or the Christians or people. In this case, it's people in general, all right? But the same principle can be brought into all of our relationships. And, and for me, I guess one of the biggest wowies was, you know, I grew up on Long Island. And on Long Island, there's a significant Jewish population. And one of the big things among Jewish people is when their sons and daughters get old enough to date. They do not want their Jewish children dating non-Jews. Because of the history of genocide uh, 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 perpetrated on Israel, plus it goes further back to the scriptures themselves, they, they believe it is their mandate not to intermarry and not to mix the blood and make an impure, um, uh, make an impure progeny, impure offspring. In, in this worldly case, it would be a Jewish person and a non-Jewish person breeding because the Jewish people think they're the people of God and the Gentiles are not. All right? So any mix is impure. And so Paul in the New Testament carries us over to the church and he says, do not be unequally yoked. Now he's speaking to an audience who is just getting born again. They're adults. There's many intermixed marriages in the church. And Paul's not addressing that. He, he actually does address it. He says, look, if you're in a marriage with an, with an unbeliever, don't leave that person. If they leave you, then let them go. Now, you're not allowed to marry again based on Torah. But anyway, that's another sermon for another day. But if they stay, they will be blessed because of you. It doesn't mean saved. It just means blessed. They're constantly exposed to the gospel, constantly exposed to a Christian. You see what I'm saying? But there's a really big reason in the foundational basis of do not intermarry. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And it's got nothing to do with Jews and Gentiles. All right. So again, today's part one, Genesis 6, 1 through 8, the evil of mankind. Now, I want you to know that some of what we're going to read today has nothing to do with mankind. It has to do with the evil of angels. But in God's dealing with the ramifications of what's going to happen and what we read today, he does not deal with the angels. He deals with mankind because mankind are his covenant people whom he created in his image to rule and reign the earth with him. That was perverted and it was defiled. All right, so why don't we dive in? This is exciting stuff. This is not stuff you'll hear preached in church every day, and I think you're going to be really blessed, and I'm certain you're going to be challenged. All right, Father God, please give me your words. Please give me your mind. 
give me your grace. May your truth go out. And may it help us to understand this, this thing we call life and why we are where we're at today as a race. In the name of Jesus. Genesis 6.1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide with man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Um, what you'll notice in these verses is, that, is I have no mention of the Noahic covenant. I'm only going to touch on it lightly this week. Next week, we're going to dive directly into the covenant. But you need to know why there was even a necessity for a covenant, don't you? You need the background. These set of scriptures that I read to you are probably the number one set of scriptures that are A, misinterpreted, or B, just not confronted at all because it's too difficult. You've got to make decisions on what you believe when you read these verses. First thing I want to do is I want to give you the standard interpretation when pastors want to preach it because it's the least confrontive. It's the least challenging to theology. Here it is. <clears throat> Verse 1. Men had daughters. No big deal. Verse 2. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Sons of God is the line of Seth. I'm telling you, this is, the main, this is not what I believe. I'm just telling you what you've probably heard if you've seen people preach on this. All right? Sons of God are the sons of Seth. Adam's and Eve's child, Seth. The, uh, and they took wives, the sons of God, so that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. The daughters of man are the children of the children of Cain. Remember, Cain was sent out after he killed Abel, and he was marked. So all the children of Cain are the daughters. That's, we're talking about the female progeny of Cain versus the male progeny of Seth, all right? They come together. Apparently, God told Seth not to do this, all right? So much so that he decides to cut the age of man down to 120 years. The Nephilim are born of this unholy union between the daughters of Seth, of the men of the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain, and they bore giants. Word Nephilim means giants. Here's my big red mark making me go, this doesn't make any sense. If I'm Italian and my wife is Czechoslovakian and we, have birth, and we birth a baby, why would that baby be a giant? <laughs> why would there be anything distinctive in this child that would make them different when you look at them to go, well, that's certainly weird. We see it all the time. The world is full of people who are mixed race. This interpretation, for the sake of comfort and ease, is the most popular interpretation you will hear. Nephilim were on the earth. So these, these children, the spawn, this evil spawn of this unholy human-to-human -human, uh, reproduction are on the earth, and they're called um, men of renown, mighty men. And then it goes on, the Lord saw the wickedness of man on the earth. Because now he's focused now in verse 5 in his retribution is directed at man, at humanity. And that's their proof that, yes, they were talking about the children of Seth and the children of Cain. Doesn't make sense to me. It's too outlandish. 
Especially when you consider that there are scriptures that indicate that the Nephilim and the sons of God were not, uh, the sons of God were not of human origin and the Nephilim were not a pure human line. All right? Now, let me go into it. Where are we on the human timeline in verse 1? When man began to multiply in the face of the earth, on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them. Where are we on the human timeline? You see, we've only gone from Genesis 1 to Genesis 6. All right? Uh, if men are beginning to multiply in our minds, we could go, okay, so you had Adam, you had Seth. Seth was killed, and you had, uh, no, you had uh, Adam and Cain and Abel. Abel was killed. Seth took his place. Then we have some other reproduction because man began to multiply in the face of the earth, and poof, Noah. Anyone want to take a stab at how much time went by? 1,056 years, give or take. A thousand years. That's half the time that's elapsed since Jesus walked on the earth. To give you an idea of how much time, it's a lot of time. This is enough time that in the grand scheme of filling a planet, you could say this few people began to spread out, but realize it's thousands and thousands of people. Hundreds of that, millions even. That's how quickly man multiplies. Genesis 7, 6. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came upon the earth. All right, so just in Noah's lifetime, 600 years went by. Never mind Adam and Eve and Seth and Cain and Abel, you know? It's a lot of time. So it's easy to miss the passing of time within all of the genealogy of Genesis 4 through 5. Second question. Who are the sons of God? Are they of the line of Seth? Like I said, I'm not buying it because Seth having a baby with a daughter of Cain is not going to give me a giant. That has to be something extraordinary in this mix. Dare I even say something supernatural, all right? Were the sons of God angels? Well, I submit to you, I mean, the short answer and the answer the church uses all the time is yes, okay? Here's the thing. The word angel is not a name for a group. The word angel is a description of a call, of a commission. An angel is a messenger. All right? Thus, when it says in the book of Revelation, in each of the letters, it says, Say to the angel of the church at Pergamum. Say to the angel of the church at Laodicea. It's not talking about angels over the church. It's talking about the pastor, the main messenger of the gospel in that church. You see? And, and what I'm trying to show you is that in the word angel, it can be applied to many different beings for many different purposes. But the, per the meaning is always the same. They're a messenger of some kind. They are delivering a message from God to man. Angels. Could be a human. Could be a spirit being. Thus, we have to have another title for those spirit beings. And that title is Sons of God. Now, the first thing I want you to know is that Sons of God is the title used for, uh, for the spirit beings in the Old Testament all the time. Sometimes they're referred to as Satan because that word means adversary. All right, but we're not up to that part of the sermon yet. Funny thing happens. When we get to the New Testament, angels are never called Sons of God. You know who's called Sons of God? You are. Because we're redeemed. We are the sons of God. All right? The angels that are discussed um, in length in the New Testament are fallen. They are no longer sons of God. What we have here is a race of beings that God created when he created the universe. He created the sons of God. The sons of God are not material they're spiritual beings. The sons of God are made in the image of God. So were we. 
aren't we? Right? But the image of God, they portray different characteristics of the image of God than we do because we are born into bodies. We're human beings. We are flesh beings. So what God did, this goes back to the Adamic covenant. Did you know? Who was the snake in the garden? All right. It was a being, right? Was the snake in the garden a fallen angel? No. What you're reading in the garden is the falling of that spirit being. All right? Let me show you. In, uh, I think it's Isaiah or Ezekiel. I'm not sure, but um, you, you're mo probably familiar with the verses. I shall ascend to the throne of the Most High. I shall do this. I shall do that. Right? And then he gets cast out of heaven. When he casts, when God casts Lucifer out of heaven, out of his lofty estate, because he, li he lived on the mountain. He, you know, Satan was actually a garden cherub for Eden. So it's no surprise that, that that spirit being is in the garden. It's not a shock. He was assigned to the garden. But here's what happened. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you see God making everything. And then he makes the earth. And who's there with God over the earth? He hasn't created man yet. It's God and the spirit race that he created when he created the heavens. Then he goes... Let us, Elohim, let us. Who's he addressing? Is he addressing the Trinity? Absolutely. But he's addressing this whole group of the higher echelon of these spirit beings who are ruling and reigning the universe with God. You see, they reign the spirit realm. And he goes, I've made this, this earthly, this physical realm called earth and the planets, whatever. Let us make man in our image. And then he sends them out and says, work the land, multiply, fill it, have dominion. Does it make sense? Am I making sense to everyone? And then you have this angel who doesn't like that plan and feels that they are being usurped by God. And they don't like man. And so what they decide, what this one being decides is, you know what? I don't like this. I disagree with this Yahweh. I shall ascend to the throne of the Most High. I shall put my throne, with the thro above the throne of Yahweh. And how does he do that? He goes down, well, he's, he's in Eden, and he goes to Eve. So when God pronounces the curse on Adam and on Eve and on Satan, the first person he curses is Satan. I'm pretty sure. You're the first or the last. Anyway, it's an impact statement. And he's, what he's basically saying, this has nothing to do with snakes. Snakes didn't have legs. This isn't like you hear all these things. It has nothing to do with it. He who said, I shall make my throne above the Most High, God responds and he goes, you will crawl on the dirt and dust will be your food. And that's the meaning. That, what you're reading in Genesis chapter 3, is the fall of that spirit being. There are three falls in the history of mankind, three angelic falls. The first one I just told you, Genesis chapter 3. The second one we're talking about today. All right? Man fell in the garden. He, he broke relationship with God. God gave Adam and Eve grace, but then he exiled them from Eden. God then still has his, it's called a divine council. He still has this group of angelic beings who co-run the universe with him. He's in charge. And when you think about it, why wouldn't it be that way? You see, we never consider that there's a whole nother society after we die with beings, beings we, we've never literally seen. 
And so there's a structure of administration of leadership, just like there is on the planet Earth. You have the president, you have, you have the president, federal over the United States. Every state has a governor. They're over the, they're over the, the state. Inside that state, you have cities. Each city has a mayor. They're over there right on down the line. All right? These spirit beings in here, in Genesis chapter 6, decided to defy God. And it's the second fall. And so what they did, and these were higher ups, man, is they came down and they, and they, they were able to manifest in physical bodies. They had this power. See, there's a reason they're referred to as sons of God and they're spirit beings. They, they literally have supernatural abilities. They're referred to as gods, little g's. All right? But any person on earth, if you were to see a spirit being who's able to materialize and dematerialize and maybe, maybe do this for you or that for you or show you this or that, and, and then said, I am God, would that be a stretch for you to believe? The Bible says that Satan's servants come as ministers of light. All right? So what these angels do is they come down, they go, wow, these, these, these girls, you know, I'd like to experience sex. This is what they did. And so what they did when they came down is they made friends with humanity. They taught humanity how to use metal. They taught humanity the basics of pharmacology. They taught humanity the basics of chemistry. They taught humanity a lot of the um, uh, technological advances for that time were introduced by these beings. And what they did, who created these beings? God. Who created us? Who created the Nephilim? It is an unholy creation that is the result of angels manifesting as human beings and having sex with humans, something they were utterly, expressly forbidden to do. They, they did not keep, it's the way the Bible terms is, they did not keep their estate as determined by God. Okay? So they're not yet fallen angels in Genesis 6 when we open up. They are sons of God, a term never given to a fallen being, angelic or human. What is described here is the falling of these beings. These angelic beings are high-ranking spirits whom are given authority to reign with Yahweh over the spiritual realm of creation. They have been given this privilege because those intended to rule and to reign with God, mankind, through the Adamic covenant, fell. And broke the covenant. They represent an upper echelon of spiritual beings. But the term angel isn't actually the name of a race. I'm just recapping everything I said. And the same concept is conveyed to the name Satan. I don't know if you know this. What does the word Satan mean in Hebrew? Anybody? Deceiver, adversary is what it literally means. He's against. All right? Matthew 16, 23, Jesus says to Peter, this is when Peter said, I won't let you go to the cross. Right after Jesus said, on you, I'll build my church, on that faith, he then tells Jesus, I won't let you die. You know, the Bible tells us that if the demonic realm had known Jesus' mission of atonement and how it would be accomplished, if they knew that it would take crucifixion, they never would have allowed Jesus to be crucified. And that's why the gospel is called the mystery of salvation. Because it was withheld from everybody. Because if the demonic knew that Jesus had to die, they never would have let him die. All right? So Jesus rebukes Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. Now, was he calling him the devil? Nope. He was calling him an adversary. Get behind me, you adversary. You're being adversarial to everything I came for. Of course I'm going to die. And if you try to stop me, I will stop you. Right? You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Now check this out. In Numbers 22, 21 through 22, 
says this. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way of his Satan. Now, the angel of the Lord is Jesus. All right? So all I'm trying to show you is that um, the word um, angel and the word Satan, they're not names of people. They're assignments of, of what a person is doing. Messenger, adversary, that kind of thing. Even God himself can be a Satan when he's going against somebody. Now, later on, the name Satan is attached to this one specific being. And this one being is the angel from Genesis chapter 3. He basically became the father of all who would rebel because he was the first one to rebel. Doesn't that make sense? I started the club. I should be in charge of the club. Right? Am I saying anything that doesn't make sense? No, it's all very reasonable. Next question. Who then are the Nephilim? And what we know for sure is that the Nephilim are the children born between this unholy union of man and uh, the angelic spirit. The word in the Hebrew is literally nephil. It means bully, tyrant, a giant. So uh, clearly these, um, these, these beings did not act kindly towards men. You see, because remember, these fallen angels, they don't like mankind. They weren't doing mankind any favor by saying, hey, I can teach you how to make swords. Did you know that I can make a, a plant, uh, this plant, we can make a powder. It's called cocaine. See these flowers over here? Yeah, they're called poppy. Wait till you see what we can do with that. They come as ministers of light, but they're bringing death. So the Nephilim are the beings produced by this unholy union of spirit beings and human beings. They are human beings in the sense that they inhabit bodies. All right? They are an unholy mix of two races. They are defiled beings as they are impure. They were created outside of what God has created, and thus they are condemned to eternal destruction. Now, I'm going to reference here the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is not in your Bible, but the book of Enoch is quoted by both Peter and Jude in the New Testament. And what that shows us is they were not living in a vacuum. They were not going, you know, oh, I got a letter from, Peter, uh, from James. I can only read this letter, James. In re relating to your spiritual life and Christianity, I can only, I have to stay in James. I can never refer to any literal work, liter work, literary work that will assist me to convey to you the message of the gospel. I don't believe the book of Enoch is scripture. I don't believe it's the inspired word of God. But I do believe it has historical value. And I do believe it has answers for us. No less than I would refer to the book of Maccabees when I'm trying to find information out about the intertestimony, intertestament period between the Old Testament and New Testament, 500 years. There's books that happened in those 500 years. I was reading a book that, uh, on the Apostle Paul, a real scholarly book. And it, and it told me, and you may remember me mentioning this, how when I was reading this book, all, how I, I came to realize all of this other literature that was available back then that we don't know about for two reasons. One, they're not in our Bible. And two, they're scholarly works that have been put away in universities and only top theologians have access to the databases where all these things are pooled. Many of them were discovered in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls when they found the caves of Qumran. All right. I'm saying all this to say to you that I'm not a heretic because I'm going to give you information that comes out of the book of Enoch right now. All right. <clears throat> the Nephilim 
were human beings that were crossbred with angels. In the book of Enoch, we're told that God curses them to destruction, but not yet. They, they have, they're awaiting the final judgment. The Nephilim will be judged when all of mankind is judged. All the, the, angels, the, the angels who came down, they're in prison. They were imprisoned way back then. They're awaiting judgment. The Nephilim were condemned to lose their bodies and to wander the earth as demonic spirits. And there's only one thing they want. Well, there's two things they want. They want to see Jesus fail, which is already lost. But since they can't do that, they want bodies. They want to influence people. They want to inhabit people. Because that's what they had. They had bodies. And that's the demons that we deal with today. All right? So that being what it is, let's move on now to the next question. And, and here's where we get into the most important thing here because God is not dealing in Genesis with the Nephilim. You get really not much spiritual growth from that information I just gave you. He's dealing with us because this is about his history with us. Covenants, right? So who are pronounced guilty? We have these spirit beings come down, procreate against the, the plan of God. We have them birth these other spirit beings who are clearly condemned with, by God along with these other beings. And, you know, but where's the bulk of God's attention? And we begin with verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only con evil continually. You see, when this happened with the, Neph with the uh, sons of God coming down, man had a choice to make. These, Neph these sons of God did not cloak themselves they didn't look like Sam the haberdasher and Jim the, the taxi driver. They look like angelic beings in human bodies. We're here to help you. That's, that's what they used. We're here to help you. And then they did what they did, right? But humanity at any point, they knew who God was. It wasn't like the, the information that happened from Genesis 1 to Genesis 6 was, was hidden away in a cave in Qumran. And they chose to defy God who gave man and woman to us because we're frail and we die. And they did what they wanted to. Eating the apple once again. You see that? All right? Because humanity is the focus of God here, not the fallen spirit beings or their offspring, the Nephilim. Humans, God's image bearers, are the ones who welcome these spirit beings when they arrive and take human wives. Humans are the ones who embrace the teachings of these spirit beings to the degree that they took them as their gods and worshipped them. You see, that's, that's something else that the Nephilim and the sons of God that came down that they wanted. And we're going to see this. Well, we're not going to see it because it's not part of the covenant. Let me just tell you real fast. After Noah goes back out, what happens next? The third fall. All right, here's what happens. In the spirit realm, because of all that's happened, God appoints spirits over every city. There are spirits in charge of earth right now. Number one is Satan. Because these beings who God appointed then fell again. Anyone want to guess where they fell? Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is a picture of a third angelic fall and really a third human fall. All right? Because the angelic were living with man and man decided... Hey, you know what? Let's build a tower to God. God doesn't want to come speak to us directly. Let's go speak to God directly. And they started building. It's called a ziggurat. All right? And God said, well, this won't do. 
and he took, you know, he still has all these angels that are on his side, and he said, let's, let us spread them out. And let's confuse their tongues so they can't talk anymore. And that's why that happens. You know when this is taken care of, Jesus fixes this in Acts chapter 2. This is the purpose of tongues. God comes down in the spirit. He enables them to speak in the foreign languages of everybody so they can go anywhere and preach the gospel. It's a restoration of what was lost at Babel. You see, you, you have to start connecting the pieces between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you will find, as we are in the covenants, you will find that the Bible is a running, progressively building narrative revealing Jesus and then showing us Jesus conquering, taking back all that the enemy stole from God. Real quick, Jesus takes uh, Peter and the disciples to, to uh, Caesarea Philippi, which is the, the fortress of pagan worship in Israel. It's called the Decapolis Center. Ten cities, ten pagan cities. Caesarea Philippi is like the number one place. And they worship Pan. And there's a big mountain. And then there's a big cave. And that cave is called the Gate of Hell. And that's where they do their sacrifices. So Jesus takes all of his disciples there. And they're like, what are we doing here? Uncomfortable. And that's where he has the conversation. And he says, Peter, who do the people say I am? You are, you are the, the son of God. And he says, amen. On that faith, I will build my church. And then you know what he does six days later? He takes them back. He takes Peter, James, and John. And he transfigures and reveals his glory. And Moses comes and Elijah comes. And you know what he's doing? You know what he's really doing? He goes to the very doorway of all the fallen spirits. And he does this. I win. And that was their wake-up call that their time is short. God is good, amen? All right, I'm all over the place. All right, so, um, so humans are the ones who embrace the teachings of these spirit beings, the, the uh, sons of God, to the degree they took them as their gods and worshiped them. All right, idolatry. It's the introduction of idolatry. All right, so here we're seeing God's dealings with mankind, not his dealings with the fallen sons of God. However, they are mentioned one other time by name in Numbers 13, 33, which really had nothing pertinent to say. It was just mentioning them as real people, these Nephilim. They were giants and they were adversaries and they made some human alliances. But for the most part, if you ran into a giant, you were going to get killed. And Goliath is one of those giants. Goliath is one of the remaining Nephilim. And God was committed ever since this fall that we're reading about today, God was committed to wiping off the Nephilim from the earth in his judgment. And he did exactly that. In fact, the last two Nephilim that we know for sure are Goliath and his brother. He had a brother, you know, it's in the Bible. And God made sure, when they were going to the promised land, he said, don't go over there, don't go over there. I've already taken care of the giants over there. Move over there. And he, and he sent Israel to all the tribes that had giants mixed in with them. You see, you don't see all these things unless you study and you dig deep and you start putting the pieces together. Or you have a pastor that does, right? All right, so... There are two New Testament scriptures that speak of the sons of God and the Nephilim. Actually, I think it's just the sons of God. 2 Peter 2.4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, right, that's the sons of God that we're reading about today, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And then it goes on. If God didn't do this, but he's basically saying he did, all right? He did do that. Jude 1, six, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So there you have it. Those 
Sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 are angels. They're fallen angels. And, and what we're seeing is their fall. No less than we're seeing in, in Genesis chapter 3, we're seeing this other spirit being, this other son of God, fall. Lucifer. All right? Now, in verse 6, it says that the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And I called this, I said, God regretted? Question mark. And then I called it God's mistake. Right? Because when we read this, we go, did God screw up? I mean, he's regretting that he did this. And what we do is we anthropomorphize. We assign to God our emotions and how we would feel these feelings and why. Right? Because if I say, that was a mistake, you could really say, to some degree, I, I sinned. I was out of God's will. It was a mistake. Clearly, none of this is, pertains to God. He never sins. He's never out of his own will. So what does this mean? That he regretted he made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. Well, we know that God doesn't sin. He's never sinned, so he's got no need to repent of anything. King James 6.6 6 says the Lord repented that he had made man on the earth. All right? um, regretted is the word in the Hebrew, noham. And it's a verb. It's an action word. It means to be sorry, to pity, to comfort, to avenge. And that doesn't mean all these things all the time. It could mean that. It could mean that. In our case here, it means to be sorry, to be sorry. Right? So we've seen here that the word has various meanings. So the context is really important to determine what's truly being said. <clears throat> My opinion is that the ESV says it better than the King James. Because the King James uses the word repent, and again, we get confused. Because when do we repent? When we sin. Bad word to use. Right? It's just, it just adds confusion. All right? Regretted is better. See, I don't have to, I don't have to be in sin to regret something that's happened between me and someone else. What's the main motivation when, when you haven't sinned, but you regret something between you and someone else? Pain. Pain. I opened myself up to this person, and this is what happened. I regret opening myself up to this person. Right? Again, I'm not saying that's what God's feeling, but what I am saying is what is written here in Genesis 6-6 six, six is, is written because humanity has grieved God. Now that's not a stretch, is it? Right? First Samuel 15-29 says this. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. And yet it said in 6.6, 6, he regretted. Well, that's a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. It's not talking about human regret. It's not speaking about sin. It's talking about pain. All right? What this is telling us is that we cannot assume everything is the same when God regrets or repents as it is when we sin and regret and repent or are sinned against. It is not. We're being shown the pain humanity has inflicted upon their creator. And I believe it's the same kind of pain that Jesus experienced, causing him to state to us in Mark 19, 19, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Or Matthew 26, 39. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we can certainly see um, and make room to allow for God to be hurt by us and to experience what that feels like. My sixth point here is verse 7, God's solution to this mess. And, and again, I'll, point, I'll direct you saying that as we move on here, the solution 
is not spoken against the angelic realm. He'll deal with them. He's dealing with us in the Bible. All right, it's like when, when Jesus said to Peter, when, when, when Peter asked him if John was going to have a seat next to him, and he's like, what is that to you? You do what I've called you to do, and don't worry about John. Right? Same kind of thing. Genesis 6-7. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Notice how man's evil is creation's evil. Right? Because he created us to have dominion, didn't he? So when Adam fell, your dog fell. Your tree fell. Your grass fell. That's why we have weeds, by the way. You see? Because man fell, so did all of creation. And this isn't a new and foreign concept. We have a precedent in Adam and his fall. It affected Eve, every other human ever born, every living thing, even all of creation. Because Adam is the federal head of the earth and of mankind. So the man for the job. God needed the right man for the job. And thank goodness there was Noah. Right? Noah is a Christ type. Just like Adam is a Christ type. If you remember when I talked about types, we know that types are imperfect and types always fall apart. You cannot just keep on saying this is equals this and Jesus, this equals this and Jesus. Eventually it breaks down because every type is a fallen human being, whereas the anti-type, Jesus, is not fallen. All right? So you need to know this because I'm only focusing on, on, on some of the bad of Noah, his character. But you need to know he's a Christ type. All right? Genesis 6, 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I titled this section, The Man for the Job, The Righteousness of Noah. All right? So he found favor in God's eyes. On what basis? See, we have to ask questions. We have to stop. All I did was read one verse. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Well, he's a fallen human being. So how did he find favor in the eyes of the Lord? I need to know. Because you know what? I'm a fallen human being. And I need favor in the eyes of the Lord. I think we all do, don't we? Right? All right. So... On what basis? The answer is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. But Noah found... Oh, wrong one, sorry. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Well, hallelujah. That's good news. I mean, it, it reminds me of what he said about King David. He is a man after my own heart. It's just one problem. We're talking about sinners. And we're talking about sinners, maybe not so much with Noah, but like David. None of you have sinned as much as David has. How many of you committed adultery then had the spouse murdered? How many of you didn't own up to it until God sent a prophet to rebuke you publicly? Talk about humiliating. Humbling, right? And David did repent. And see, there's, there's our first clue. All right. Noah was declared righteous. Noah was declared blameless. How can you be blameless? Blameless literally means you don't sin because you have nothing to be blamed for. That's like a meritorious statement, right? Noah walked with God. On the basis of his righteousness and blamelessness, he was allowed, he was blessed and privileged to walk with God. So, now I have another question. On what basis is Noah decreed righteous and blameless if clearly being human, he was in fact a fallen human, prone to all the desires of the sin nature? Here's the answer. Hebrews 11 Verse 7. By faith, Noah, 
being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world, and he became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, I want to show you something. Noah, it wasn't like God came down and said, Noah, I want you to construct an ark. This ark is representative of my son, who I will send in 2,000 years to Nazareth. And so when you go in the ark, you'll be entering into Jesus. And I will shut the door, and the door is Jesus. God didn't do all that. God was revealing Jesus progressively. And this is the next revelation. That's for Noah... When God said, I'm going to destroy the earth, Noah said, yes, Lord. God said, I want you to construct a boat. Noah said, yes, Lord. He said, when I tell you, I want you to go in that boat with two of every kind I bring you, Noah said, yes, Lord, and then he did it. He didn't know the boat represented Jesus Christ. All he knew is that his salvation came from obeying what God told him to do. And because he believed, that was counted to him as salvation. This rudimentary gospel was enough to save Noah, despite himself. No less than Adam and Eve's believing God when he covered them with skins, that this actually meant something. And that they were okay with him, even if the relationship had been broken. All right? For human beings, being declared righteous and blameless has nothing to do with sin, brothers and sisters. And everything to do with saving faith. Everything to do with believing that God can save you despite yourselves. It's not a license it's not permission for you to go live lives of sin. You are called to holiness. You are called to obey. We're just not condemned anymore. It is the most significant difference between the covenant of grace fully established through Jesus and the covenant of grace in the Old Testament uh, and all the other covenants in the Old Testament which kind of mix works and grace. All right? As a result of the fall in the Noahic covenant, Genesis 8.20, then Noah built an ark to the Lord, an altar to the Lord, and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt, burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Now, do you see this? He's making this pledge, but in the same breath saying, despite the fact that I know man is still evil. And what I want you to see here is that in the ark, in God doing this great redo, when they got off, it wasn't like a wholly redeemed people without sin exited the ark. It was a fallen people. That was not solved in this great redo. All right? So much so that when he um, made covenant with Noah, it's a repetition of the Adamic covenant. That's the redo. All right? Never again will God strike down every living creature, and man is not restored to a pre fall state. Genesis 9 2. The fear of you. Who? Noah? Well, yeah. But Noah is now a federal head, just like Adam. The fear of you, human beings, and the dread of you, human beings, shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens and upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hands they are delivered. That's a statement of, remember, Adamic covenant. This is a statement of dominion. All right? So you see, and I'm, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about my old cat, Zoe. I used to feed my squirrels in my backyard, and I had these two picnic benches, and I put three things of squirrel food, and I used to have like 15 squirrels come, and my cat would sit in between them. She loved them. And they jump all around her. And I'm like, son of a gun. And I go out there, they all run. 
That's this. By instinct, all, in the atom, all of the living beings besides man fear us because of the fall. All right? Pre-fall, there was a peaceful coexistence between man and animal, man and insect, man and snake. I, wanna, I, wanna, uh, I don't have the scripture here, but one of the verses, it's in the Old Testament, I think it's Isaiah, where it talks about the new earth. And it says that the lion shall lay down with the lamb and the baby can stick his hand inside the viper's pit. That's snakes in the ground. He could stick his hand in, a, in the den of vipers and the vipers would be like, oh, <laughs> that's going to be restored. So in case you were wondering, on the new earth there will be animals. I pray it's my animals. I pray God would do this for me. I'm okay if he doesn't. I really am. But I prefer to have them all with me. Anyway, okay. So pre-fall, there was a peaceful coexistence between humankind and the animal kinds of the world. This has been broken, and it will remain fully broken until the new heavens and the new earth are fully established. I mentioned to you when God sent them out, he wasn't sending out a, an unfallen Adam redo. He was sending out a fallen Noah. Evidence? Genesis 9, 20 and 21. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. Good. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Very bad. Anyone know what happens next? Lot comes in and expresses the first view of homosexuality in the Bible. You don't know the story. They came out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, it was Abraham, uh, Noah, and his three sons. And he built this vineyard. And one night he got hammered and he went to his tent and he passed out naked. And Lot came in and gawked and oogled and went back and laughingly or whatever said to his brothers, Did you see dad? And they were like, what is this you have done? They disrespected Noah. Uh, he disrespected Noah, and they went in. What did they do? They went in, they took, his, they took a, a covering, and they would not look at him. They walked in backwards, and then they covered his nakedness. Thank you. Ham, and what are the other two sons? Shephath and... Shem, and, yeah, Shem, Ham, and Jephath. Right, it was Ham. It's not in my notes, Sorry. But you get the point. This is sinners on a, re, uh, it's on a redone earth. All right? So it's a second fall of mankind. Now, look, if, if that didn't happen, we, we'd still have enough of a fall in Adam. But, you know, um, one of the things that was pointed out to me is if I ask you, why does the world have all the problems that it has today? And we boiled it down. You would tell me, well, because of the fall in the Garden of Eden, blah, 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 apple, don't eat, eat, right? But if you asked this, a second temple Jew, Old Testament Jew, why the world is the mess that it is, they would go, well, you see, there were these three things that happened. In the garden, there was a fall. Then God had to destroy the earth because of another fall. And then mankind tried to build a tower to God, and there was another fall. And when we go to the New Testament, you're going to see Jesus, like I did for you today with Mount Horeb in, um, in uh, Caesarea Philippi when he snubs the nose of the demons. You see in Jesus' ministry that he fixes each one of these. He responds to each one of these falls in his public ministry. It's amazing that you see, you know, and, and so we sit here as people, we're still in a fallen world, we're still in these fallen bodies, we're still, life is hard, life is painful. Yes, I have times of smiles, laughs, and joys, but it's generally, you know, you ask anybody who's in their 60s or 70s, and they're talking to a 20-year-old, their main advice is buckle up, cupcake. You have no idea how hard it gets, right? We 
we have not entered into the fullness of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He has fixed all these things, but he is doing everything in according to his plans and purposes and his own timeline. All right? And so here we are. It's not like you were given a superpower to, like, never sin again. It's not like you were given a superpower that anything anybody does to you, you're Teflon. Right? How many of you have reacted poorly recently to anything? Right? We're not Teflon. The evidence of salvation in a Christian is not that you're Teflon. The evidence of, of being a Christian is that you persevere. You keep going. Because you're not looking to this world anymore. You're looking to what comes next. My citizenship is in heaven. It's not on earth. And I look for a greater city. A new Jerusalem. Amen? Amen? So as Adam fell, so did Noah. Two Christ types who fall short and yet at the same time show us snapshots of Christ through their lives. But that is the very definition of a type. A type reflects an anti-type. The anti-type is the fulfillment. In this case, Jesus. But the type always, while reflecting that anti-type, a type is always imperfect. And a type always falls short. You never see Jesus getting hammered and going to sleep naked in his tent. All right? You're not going to see it. He had a chance to. Don't you realize? When he began his ministry, the first thing that God did was allow Satan to come and tempt him. Just like he did to Adam. Probationary period. Right? With Jesus, though, he's God. You can't even really apply that. But Jesus had three opportunities to betray God. Just like, the, um, just like the sons of God. Just like Lucifer. Just like Adam. <coughs> Jesus never sinned. He never fell short. He always listened to the voice of the Father. And he did, he does, and he always will do God's will alone. On this we count on. His sinlessness and his righteousness before God. I depend on it. And the righteousness applied and accounted. Credited to us. And I, and I always use the accounting term. Credited to your account. Well, that's true. Credited to you. It's not something in a piece of paper. It's something that God, when he looks at you, sees the righteousness of Christ if you are his. On that we count on. His righteousness applied to us. Why do I count on this? Because I need it. I will go to hell if I don't have it. The nicest most charitable, loving person in the world who rejects Jesus Christ will be damned. They're fallen. We can't escape it. The only difference between me and the greatest sinner walking the earth that doesn't know Jesus is Jesus. It's not my righteousness. You see how free and wonderful a gift that is? I have spent my life being imperfect. It's so easy to uh, be focused on my imperfections and my flaws and my mistakes um, and, and to disregard any of the good that I've done. You know, we, we, we as Christians, we like to concentrate not on the progress we're making, but on the progress we haven't made. I'm a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart. There is nothing good in me to, war to warrant eternal life. I would love to be able to stand here before you today and say, I've been a Christian 20 years and I don't sin anymore. But I'd be sinning if I said that. Right? This is why Jesus came. He came so that you could have eternal life. He came so that without price, you can be redeemed. As you are right now in this moment. Now, I'm warning you, 
when you give your life to Jesus, he takes that seriously. So if you're not committed, I want you to know he's committed. And he'll do whatever it takes in your life to break you, if that's the problem, right? But it's all worth it, you see, because you think you're living in this life now that's 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. You think this is it. And you don't realize this is nothing. This is not, there's a whole nother realm we're going to. And, and, and what we're experiencing now, we'll never experience again. Living on a planet separated from God. We will never experience that again. We will live on a planet. It will be renewed. It will be sinless. And God will make his abode. Eden will once again be on the mountain of earth. This is the only time. 80, 90, 100 years. And you're going you're gonna to throw away Christ and, and God so that you can enjoy this when, when eternity is... You can't even put a number on it. And we can live with him in peace and love and harmony and joy for that un, unnumberable amount of days. Or we can live damned in a place of misery for all that time. And I'm being nice. You know how I usually describe it. All right? And he did this for nothing. And people refuse him. Lord, I, I pray that, that people would not refuse you. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But those who do not believe stand condemned already because they have refused the one and only son of God. You see, we read uh, John 3, 16. We, don't, we very rarely go past that to read 17, 18, 19, and 20. We are condemned already, and there's nothing the nicest person in the world can do about that except cry to Jesus for salvation. Now, before I close, I want to quickly, that's the sermon, amen? Can you go back to the first slide, slide number one? Take that on the stream and in the church. How do you like that picture? I want to show you some. Now, we didn't talk about the rainbow and the covenant. We're going to do that next week. But now you know the predicament, don't you? It was a predicament. This was a predicament started by spirits who hate men and wanted to defy God. And when this is all over, God says, I will put my bow in the sky. Did you know there's no Hebrew word for rainbow? There isn't one. The word for bow is an archer's bow. Do you think God didn't know that? And God, well, I guess I'll just have to use the word for archer's bow. Oh, well. It represents, what direction is the arrow pointing? It is God's promise to man to take the penalty for our sin. That hand you see is the hand of Christ, and that red spot is the blood of Jesus because he took the arrow for you. And that's what the rainbow testifies to, that Jesus will come again and that all things will be redeemed and restored that believe on him. Just another revealing of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Amen? Amen. Next week, we'll go over the actual covenant. Father God, I praise your holy name and I thank you. I ask you, Lord, to save I'm a weak man, Lord. I'm frail. I, I, I don't have the power to save people, Lord. I have the desire to preach your word and your gospel and see people be saved, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, please save. We give you the glory for being the power of the universe over all things whose number one character is love. Praise your holy name, Lord. Amen. Take the worship team.